Hello, my name is Jade Spence and I work as a technical officer at a charity called the Humane Slaughter Association, which is based in the United Kingdom. I have been asked to provide you with information on animal welfare at the time of killing and specifically some of the important points with regard to small scale on farm killing of poultry. I will start with an introduction to the Humane Slaughter Association, which I will hereafter often refer to as the HSA. There will be a brief discussion of legislation. Then we will review specific methods of stunning and killing, including mechanical percussive stunning, electrical stunning and bleeding of animals. Throughout this presentation, the HSA provides links that may prove useful Please be aware that some of the slides in this presentation or the web links may contain images of animals being handled or killed. But because I imagine we will have a family audience of all ages today, I have limited such content. So if anyone wishes to find out more detail on this subject, then please refer to www.hsa.org.uk for HSA's illustrated guides. The Humane Slaughter Association was founded in 1911. We are a charity registered in England and we are independent and aim to provide practical and constructive advice. We are very specific in our remit and we specialise in the welfare of animals that are farmed for food, specifically during their transport, their time in livestock markets and at the time they are killed, whether it is slaughter for consumption, killing for disease control or to prevent suffering, for example, if animals are injured. The HSA does not judge whether humans should or should not farm or eat animals. But whilst humans continue to use animal products, the HSA focuses on how to slaughter animals as humanely as possible, with humane meaning to cause the least amount of suffering. So how does the HSA go about promoting animal welfare within its fields of interest? There are four main areas, the first of which is scientific research. The HSA bases its recommendations and advice on peer-reviewed scientific evidence and we like to try and encourage students into the field of animal welfare during transport markets and killing to try and improve the welfare of farmed livestock globally. We offer Dorothy Sidley Memorial scholarships each year for students or industry trainees to carry out a research project of their interest within the HSA's remit. If you're interested in applying for funding, we accept applications each year from October until the end of February. Please see our website for further details. Once the research has been carried out, we then like to put its recommendations into the development of new systems. And an example of that is the Cash Poultry Killer Captive Bolt, which we will be discussing later on in the presentation. Finally, once new systems have been developed, then the HSA tries to provide education and training material for the uptake of those systems within industry. For example, we can provide printed publications, instructional DVDs, and we're now introducing online resources as training packages. We also run training courses for veterinarians, farmers, slaughtermen, and various other organisations. And finally, we provide information and advice to a range of bodies. For more information and to look at our annual reports and newsletters, please see our website. Everyone who keeps poultry as pets or for a few eggs for the table will at times have to deal with emergencies concerning bird welfare. In addition, those who hope to routinely slaughter their poultry for consumption of the meat will have to consider further how best to perform the killing process. For anyone considering purchasing and rearing poultry, particularly for meat consumption, I would urge you to first consider whether you think you would wish to, or are physically able to, perform the slaughter process yourself. If you cannot kill the birds yourself, this can be a difficult situation, because it is unlikely that a poultry slaughterhouse will be willing to receive and slaughter birds they do not own, for reasons of biosecurity and preventing the potential transmission of diseases such as bird flu. 
Therefore, anyone planning to purchase and rear poultry for meat consumption must be willing and prepared to slaughter the birds themselves because other options may turn out to be limited. Killing methods can be similar, whether for euthanasia or for slaughter for consumption. When considering how we might stun and kill poultry, not all methods will be acceptable for all types or species of bird, so we must be careful to choose an appropriate method to minimise the risk of suffering. Discussing in detail or seeing in person the realities of slaughtering animals can be difficult for people and certain methods or techniques may be viewed as more violent or aesthetically unpleasing than others. However, how a method appears may in fact be very different to the scientific objective reality for animal welfare. If consumers have concerns for a processor's use of certain techniques which are scientifically known to be advantageous for animal welfare, it is worthwhile taking the time to explain to potential customers why certain procedures are performed and how they reduce the risk of bird suffering at the time of slaughter. Welfare is about the individual and therefore as keepers of poultry we have a great responsibility to many individual birds. Scientific research suggests that avian pain is likely to be experientially similar to mammalian pain and therefore equally ethically relevant. Poultry welfare must be considered during not only their day-to-day -day husbandry but also when the time comes to kill them. Most people feel a moral responsibility to not cause fear, pain and suffering to living creatures and for many species that responsibility is reflected in our legislation. In addition to legislation, codes of practice written by governments, non-governmental organisations or by producer groups raise the bar for acceptable standards. No matter whether slaughtering animals on a large scale or a small scale, meat quality is a measurable effect of welfare in many species and the aim is damage limitation. Because capture, transport and restraint can be stressful for animals and because handling, stunning and killing procedures can cause suffering if not performed correctly, processors must do all they can to minimise the risk of frightening animals or causing them pain which may otherwise indirectly harm the quality and financial value of the resulting animal product that they have otherwise worked hard to produce. As an aside, you might be interested to know that we also see meat quality problems in fish if their handling at the time of slaughter is less than ideal. On the HSA website homepage, you can view a free video that explains why concerns about fish welfare are becoming more prominent and describes the availability of stunning equipment for fish and how consumers can identify higher welfare finfish products. So returning to the main topic, Retailers often demand higher quality and higher welfare animal products, based partly on their customers' perception of what is acceptable or desirable. Human health and safety is also a good reason for maintaining high levels of welfare. Stressed animals tend to react unpredictably and can cause injury. Whilst this is typically more important with large mammalian livestock species, a large turkey stag or goose wing can give quite a clout in the right place. So Paddock lays down rules for protecting animals that are bred or kept for the production of their body parts, whether that be meat, wool or eggs, for example. And they must be spared any avoidable pain, distress or suffering during any of the procedures related to slaughtering. And avoidable is considered when an operator breaches the rules of Paddock or if they use permitted practices that do not reflect state of the art. So there's very much an emphasis on food business operators remaining up to date and progressing with technology and scientific developments. And just to discuss definitions briefly, slaughter is defined as killing animals intended for human consumption and killing and stunning are defined as you can see in the slide. And it's worth mentioning that the EU defines simple stunning as a method that does not cause instantaneous death. So, for example, captive bolt stunning or head-only electrical stunning. And these methods must be followed up by a killing method 
such as bleeding or pithing, electrocution or prolonged exposure to anoxia. Some of the national legislation protecting animal welfare is listed here. Be aware that via the devolved administrations, there is parallel legislation in each of the constituent countries of the UK, including for implementing the European regulations on animal transport and on animal killing. You can use these web links to find more information on legislation in your area, including if you reside or operate outside of Scotland. You can also contact the Animal and Plant Health Agency if you wish to discuss registering your flock or whether you need a licence for legal permission to kill animals on farm. So I want to try to cover the main scenarios for smallholders, starting with those owners who occasionally slaughter their poultry for their own private household's consumption. Whilst the EU law does not apply in these circumstances, national laws do, in that you must stun poultry, rabbits or hares prior to bleeding them. If someone from outside the household performs the killing for you, they should have a national licence attesting to their competence in the procedure. This is to increase the likelihood that persons understand how to protect animal welfare during killing and are less likely to cause avoidable suffering. As an aside from today's main subject of poultry, smallholders also often keep pigs or sheep and may wish to either slaughter the animals themselves for private consumption or to send the animals to a slaughterhouse which will kill the animal and cut the carcass ready for its return to the owner. The most commonly used methods for on-farm killing are captive bolt stunning or killing with firearms, and free HSA guidance, including videos, is available on how to perform these methods depending on the species concerned. If you are considering sending an animal to a slaughterhouse and you wish to familiarise yourself with how the slaughterhouse might stun and kill the animal, then at the same web link, HSA's other online guides illustrate the type of procedures your animals might undergo and how the animal's welfare should be protected. For example, electrical stunning is a common method used by medium scale red meat slaughterhouses. So the other main scenario for smallholders are those owners who occasionally slaughter their poultry on farm for gifting, trade or sale to others outside their household, whether at the farm gate or to local retailers such as butchers. Even though small scale, this type of production is still considered to be commercial because it is performed in the course or furtherance of a business or for reward, for example, an exchange of goods, services or money. Poultry killed for this purpose must be stunned by competent persons and spared from avoidable suffering. So one way of assuring that killing and related operations are carried out by persons with the appropriate level of competence is the certification or licensing system operated by the competent authorities. For UK producer processors directly supplying poultry meat and generally slaughtering less than 10,000 birds per year, Scotland requires a certificate of competence, whereas England and Wales require a Watock licence. If you think you might need a Scottish COC or a Watock licence, contact your local APHA office. The web link for contacting APHA is provided on a previous slide. Just a reminder, slaughter is the killing of animals intended for human consumption, whilst emergencies include killing to alleviate suffering, for example, injured animals or those with a disease associated with severe pain or suffering. The HSA recommends the use of captive bolt stunning, and we will look at this method in a little more detail in a minute, as we will with electrical stunning because these are the two commonest methods of on-farm stunning for poultry. 
Cervical dislocation without prior stunning may put animal welfare at risk, so the HSA does not recommend neck dislocation as a means of slaughtering poultry unless they are first stunned with another method such as captive bolt stunning. This is because it takes approximately 15 milliseconds for a vertebrate animal to feel pain, and even the most experienced stock persons might, from start to finish, struggle to complete a dislocation in this very short amount of time. However, whilst neck dislocation is not recommended for routine slaughter of healthy birds, neck dislocation can be a useful technique for alleviating suffering in occasional animal welfare emergencies. If any of your birds die of natural causes, it is worthwhile practicing neck dislocation on them to improve your competency and reduce the risk of any live bird's suffering when the time comes for you to have to do it for real. You might be interested to know that a handheld tool called the LiveTech Nex, designed to assist with performing neck dislocation, was launched in 2019 as a result of a PhD project on chickens that was funded by the HSA. And you can read more about this in HSA's annual report from that year. Manual percussive blows to an animal's head can be successful, but are fraught with risks of missing the target or with delivering insufficient impact energy to cause unconsciousness. And EU legislation reflects that concern. As such, a captive bolt stunner is a more suitable, controlled form of percussive blow and is preferred for animal welfare for routine slaughter of poultry. And finally, severing the head from the neck kills an animal by stopping the flow of oxygenated blood to the brain. But without any form of prior stunning, it could cause suffering. So decapitation should only be performed in emergencies for animal welfare and care should be taken to perform decapitation with a knife that is sharp enough to cut through bone in one rapid movement. I would like to draw your attention to one important point. Do not be tempted by relatively affordable, less bloody equipment such as these, which claim to dislocate the neck, but in fact simply crush it, causing death by asphyxiation over at least one and a half minutes. This type of equipment is less effective at disturbing brain function than neck dislocation. The key sign of effective stunning is an absence of rhythmic breathing. Neuromuscular spasms, and in particular we can classify these into the tonic phase where animals tend to be rigid and stiff-legged for example, and the clonic phase which occurs afterwards where the animals tend to relax a bit and the limbs often convulse and kick. Generally, we want to see neuromuscular spasms after a stunning method has been applied because they tend to indicate that the brain has lost control of the body and spinal reflexes are persisting randomly. Brainstem reflexes include the corneal reflex, the palpebral reflex and the pupillary light reflex. Absence of all of these reflexes indicates effective stunning and most likely brain death as well. It's worth bearing in mind that expressions of effective stunning can depend on the species and the stunning method and also the type of animal, including its state of health. For example, some animals display more tonic and clonic spasms than others and poultry will also flap severely. Which can be unsettling if someone is unaware of this and mistakenly interprets it as escape behaviour. The type of electrical stunning can be a factor as well. For example, the mode of application of stunning can make a difference. So if we electrically stun poultry across the head only, they will flap violently for approximately five seconds. And once the muscles are exhausted, this behavior stops. But poultry stun where the current flows through the whole body do not show wing flapping because the whole body is under tetanus. Captive bolt stunning is a type of mechanical percussive stunning and is very common in many countries, particularly for the stunning of cattle. It works by percussively striking the animal's head and causing a concussion in the animal. It is not the act of a bolt entering the animal's brain that is the main component of captive bolt stunning. 
It is the concussive effect, and this is why non-penetrative captive bolt stunners can work well. The most important aspect of captive bolt stunning is the velocity of the bolt and the impact energy it generates when it hits the animal's head. Whilst the captive bolt method might appear extreme or arresting to the senses, and sometimes bloody in small animals like poultry, its immediacy and power offer a very high level of reliability for protecting animal welfare compared to other methods. Unlike mammalian captive bolts, which have a long bolt that enters the animal's head, poultry stunners have either a flat bolt head or a convex bolt head. The convex bolt head is for larger birds such as ducks, turkeys and geese and is designed to focus the impact energy towards and into the brain. The bird should be restrained appropriately and preferably within a cone to support the bird's body weight but also to restrain the wings. The muzzle of the stunner should be placed on the highest part of the head between the eye and the ear and in the middle to ensure an effective stun the bird should be immediately checked for signs of effective stunning and in particular for an absence of rhythmic breathing. The bird will convulse involuntarily by displaying severe wing flapping and kicking, but as long as it is not breathing and there is no corneal reflex, we can be fairly sure the stun has been effective. For further information and a video demonstration of captive bolt stunning of poultry, please view the web link at the bottom of the slide. Other makes of captive bolt stunner are available and the manufacturer's instructions should be followed accordingly. One tip is to avoid using cheaper spring-powered captive bolts unless they have been scientifically verified to cause immediate unconsciousness. Spring-powered captive bolts are typically too low in power to be consistently reliable, particularly for larger birds. Check that the knocker head is not damaged, not come loose from the bolt, and that it is not touching one side of the muzzle cowling, which might indicate a bent bolt. Before each shot, the stunner should be checked to ensure there is no debris around the muzzle, that the muzzle cowling can be fully screwed onto the stunner breech, and to ensure the bolt is fully retracted into the barrel so that it will build up sufficient velocity at the point of impact to generate enough energy to stun effectively. Battery and gas powered devices may require initial shots to fully charge the stunner with sufficient gas to effectively stun. Similarly, when gas canisters run low, there is a significant risk of ineffective stuns, so these devices must be carefully monitored. Captive bolt stunners must be thoroughly cleaned after each session of use and stored in clean, dry conditions. Cleaning is of paramount importance with cartridge powered models because if left unclean, even over a weekend, any dirt and the carbon deposits collected inside the device will harden and reduce firing power, potentially causing ineffective stuns and animal suffering. When dismantled for cleaning, the stunner's individual components should be checked for wear, particularly the breech and the recuperator sleeves, which return the bolt to its pre firing resting position. Recuperator sleeves tend to wear unevenly at a rate that depends on their positioning within the barrel of the stunner. So, after cleaning, reorder them to ensure they each wear more evenly and so that all sleeves are likely to be replaced before they become too old to function appropriately. Service the captive bolt stunner according to the manufacturer's instructions. It is important to remember that when an animal's neck is cut, it will not die immediately upon performance of that action. Rather, it will take a while for enough blood to drain from the brain to cause brain death. And it then becomes important how we perform that neck cut and which blood vessels we sever. The fewer the blood vessels we cut, and in particular the fewer of the arteries that we cut, the longer the time it takes for the bird to die. Indeed, severing both arteries, or severing both arteries and both jugular veins, do produce the fastest times to death. If you only sever one artery and one vein, the time to death increases dramatically. 
and without any arteries severed further still. Unilateral neck cuts that only cut the blood vessels on one side of the neck are therefore not recommended for best practice and neither are methods such as beak cuts where a thin knife is inserted into a bird's mouth and that's because these quite often will only cut the jugular vein anastomosis and will miss the carotid arteries. If the animal has been stunned with a reversible stunning method, then this means the animal could recover consciousness during bleeding and it would be a severe welfare issue. So how can we achieve severance of both carotid arteries? Well, to sever the carotids, it is essential to cut into the muscle of the neck and up to the vertebrae. Well, the HSA recommends a ventral neck cut where the entire underside or throat of the bird is opened. That also enables you to see whether you've cut the carotid arteries as well. And it's important to know what you're looking at. The jugular veins are thin walled vessels because they're taking blood back down to the heart and the lungs. And therefore the blood is visible inside. The carotid arteries, however, are taking oxygenated blood up to the brain and therefore they are thick-walled vessels which are under pressure. So generally you cannot see the blood inside, all you can see are white tubes within the muscle, and they are the critical vessels that need to be cut at slaughter. Birds should be left in the restraint device for the legal minimum bleed time before moving or otherwise manipulating them you must check that birds are dead before resuming processing. If any bird shows signs of life just prior to the start of further processing, you must kill it immediately with a backup method and investigate the stunning equipment and the quality of the neck cut. Electrical stunning has the potential to be very humane but it can also be misused and cause suffering if operators are unclear how best to apply it or if equipment is inadequate. A current of sufficient magnitude must pass through the brain to disrupt normal brain activity to produce a state of unconsciousness. This stunned state will persist for a period of time that may depend on the electrical parameters used and the mode of application, for example, whether the electricity is applied across only the head, or across the head and the body. Passing electricity across a part of the body without it also passing through the brain is unlikely to cause a loss of consciousness and is extremely inhumane. Similarly, passing a current of insufficient magnitude across the head will not cause unconsciousness either. However, both of these scenarios may cause conscious paralysis and extreme suffering. Pre-stun shocks can occur if operators do not properly restrain the bird and it is able to move at the moment before or as the current is applied. Irrespective of whether you plan to use an electrical stunner that applies current across only the head using an electrode positioned on each side of the head, or if you plan to use a stunner that applies current across the whole body from the head to the feet, it is essential that you ensure the electrodes span the brain. This is because electricity will, if allowed, always take the shortest path of least resistance through more conductive tissues rather than through the skull to the brain. So if the electrode position means the brain is not within the current pathway, it is unlikely the birds will be stunned unconscious. Placing electrodes across the neck is not good practice for animal welfare, nor is placing an electrode in a conscious bird's mouth. In addition, if the voltage is too low or the electrical resistance is too high, as can be the case in waterfowl or aged poultry with denser skulls, birds will not receive enough current to render them unconscious. It is for this reason that captive bolt stunning offers a more reliable means of stunning most species of poultry. Poultry must always be bled immediately after all types of electrical stunning. For this reason, stunning should not begin until someone is present and ready to bleed the animal. 
If only one person is responsible for stunning and bleeding the birds, they must complete all activities for one bird before moving on to the next. Otherwise, if a bird is not immediately cut to cause bleeding, it could recover consciousness very quickly and will likely experience severe pain and suffering as a result of recovering from the electrical stun, which puts the muscles under strain, and from the cut being performed whilst conscious or if it recovers with a cut throat during bleeding. As with captive bolt stunning, cleaning and maintenance are vital for ensuring your stunning equipment won't let you down. Electrical resistance is increased and current reduced by poor contact, for example if electrodes are dirty or worn. So to finish, it is helpful to know that under PATOC, manufacturers of restraint and stunning or killing equipment are required to provide customers with instructions, which are also available online, that describe how the operator can ensure optimal conditions for animal welfare during use. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have found it informative and useful and I look forward to receiving your questions. If you are interested in reading further on this subject, please view HSA's online guides, technical information posters and technical notes, which are all accessible from this web link. If you are interested in becoming a member of the HSA or perhaps fancy some HSA gifts or Christmas cards for family and friends, then please take a look at our support web page. Thank you.